Howdy, 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 everyone. I am Stephen Grenade. Let's play some interactive fiction. We're going to be playing Zazzled by Steph Cherrywell. Uh, Steph is a two-time winner of the interactive fiction competition, the yearly competition for short works of interactive fiction and interactive narrative. And I think she is only the second person to ever do that. Um, her game, uh, Brain Guzzlers from Beyond, I believe, uh, won in 2015, and the one we'll be playing today, Zazzled, won in 2019. Steph is an excellent writer, um, puzzle crafter, just all around really great at interactive fiction. And I've not played Zazzled before, so I'm very excited uh, to give that a try. So, without further ado, let's get Zazzled. <clears throat> Zazzled, a spirited game by Steph Cherrywell. Hiya, fish! My name is Hazel Green, and your name is You Lucky Devil, because you're about to do what a million jealous dames only wish they could. Be me for a night. Before we get to it, though, I gotta ask you, you want to give the rules of the game a little once-over? This will be especially useful if you haven't played a text adventure before, but even if you're really on the trolley, it might help to see which commands you'll be using. Um, now, I've played a fair amount of interactive fiction, but I always like to look and see what any special commands are similar that a game might be using, because that is often helpful information. So looking through this, um, she points to ah, my beginner's guide to interactive fiction. Um, I'm going to skip that and assume I still remember how interactive fiction works. Uh, so we've got... The usual commands, inventory, look, eat, drink, wear, take off, push, blow, object. And I really mean just object. Don't go getting any ideas, see? Uh, I have to be very careful that I don't lapse into, like, um, newsreel, tonight, tonight's news kind of voice. I will do my best. So that's something I don't see a lot of. Uh, heel tap, toe tap, click heels. So those are unusual. I'll keep those in mind. All right, so let's get started. Now let's get to it already. See, she agrees with me. Starting now, you're me, Hazel Green, the swellest Sheba ever to grace a gin joint. You're parked in the lounge of the prestigious Grand Poseidon Hotel with a gullet full of giggle water, and you've been making the bedroom eyes across the room at a fella who you're just about sure is that hot pepper pie of an artist who's been in all the papers lately. Sure looks like it's going to be a nifty night. Raid! Oh, fooey. The lounge erupts into the kind of chaos you haven't seen since Komodo's last two-for-one stocking sale. Shrieks ring out. Patrons, in various degrees of spliffification, <laughs> are fighting each other to get to the exits. The bartender bowls over some Sheba and a mink on his way to the door, but a couple of bulls from the SPD scoop him up a few feet shy. Now the last thing you need is to get pinched with the old lady already on the warpath because of what you did to the Ford. That doesn't sound good. And could the timing be any lousier? You just dropped half a clam on this drink and you haven't even touched it yet. So then we have two options. Toss it out and beat feet for the doors or hide under the table and gulp it down. Uh, one of the things that I really appreciate about a lot of Steph's work is that she will have these choice-based portions in what is otherwise a traditional parser game where you're typing commands and doing things like that. Uh, it really lets you move through the um, sections like this really nicely. I, of course, am going to hide under the table and gulp it down because that seems like the kind of thing this character would do. The old lady can buzz right off. You're going to have what's yours and no blue nose is telling you otherwise. For a dame of your iron constitution, the words drink and under the table aren't exactly bedfellows. But there's a first time for everything. You duck under the tablecloth and slug the juice back in a single well-practiced gulp. All right, I love the joke construction there. That's very nice. And realize you've made a horrible mistake. You just took an enormous mouthful of water. You expel the vile liquid in a spray that would make a great white whale turn green with envy. Ugh, that wasn't a watered-down drink. That was ordinary tap water. It didn't even have a twist of lemon. You cough and splutter, sputter as the poisonous slop dribbles down your chin. That's enough to turn a girl sober, which you realize to your horror... You now also are. Some lady prohi? Uh, that one doesn't, I don't know. 
strides up to the bar, parting the sea of confused patrons like a Moses in sensible shoes. She doesn't look much older than you are, but her face has blue nose written all over it. This establishment is in flagrant disregard of the Volstead Act, she announces, and by order of the state of Washington is now closed for business. Uh, it's part of what happens when you're drinking during Prohibition. The owner appears from the back room, looking like a side of beef in a very expensive suit. He's flanked by a weedy little guy with oily hair. There must be some mistake, the owner says, smiling as he pulls out a wad of greenbacks the size of a brick. We would never serve alcohol here. The pro, he puts her hands on her hips and nods to the phalanx of bulls behind her. Dishonest Donnie Cantaloupes. Don't pay him any mind, boys. He's constitutionally incapable of telling the truth. I want you to go over every inch of this place. Let's see just how much trouble you're in, Mr. Cantaloupes. Great name. As the bulls peel off, Donnie Cantaloupes tucks the bills back into his pocket, I guess a giant brick, and leans down stone-faced. You shouldn't be careful, miss. The last agent who tried to shut me down is still alive and completely unharmed. The witty guy leans in, too. Allow me to translate on account of the boss's unique speech impediment, making it difficult to parse his meaning. The boss is saying you ought to be careful, because the last agent who tried to shut him down caught a bad case of dead. And that's the sort of thing that could be contagious if you get my drift. Right, boss? Wrong. That means right, see? The lady pro, he straightens. Mr. Cantaloupes, if you're attempting in your unique way to threaten me, then you must assuredly can expect the arrival of another think in the near future. As soon as we confirm the presence of alcohol on the premises, one of the bulls coughed. <sighs> Agent Bird. What is it, Jonathan? There's no alcohol. Obviously, he's hidden his supply. Keep looking. In the meantime, tally up the drinks. Each and every one is a separate violation. I intend to press charges for every single one of them. That's just it, Agent Bird. There's no alcohol in these drinks. None. Can't smell it. Can't taste it. You administered the McGinley test? Of course, and McGinley's still on his feet, sober as a judge. What? Agent Bird and Donnie Catalobe say in unison. Are you telling me this crowd became this inebriated without a drop of alcohol? Nonsense, Bird continues. Well, that's the other thing, the bull says. Nobody here's actually drunk. They're just disheveled and confused. Agent Bird gapes. But that's preposterous, she raises a hand. Jonathan, secure the exits. None of you are leaving this hotel until we are able to determine the nature of this deception. Another of Donnie Cantaloupe's minions scurries up. Boss, boss, he squeaks. I checked on the uh, barrels of mineral water in the cellar, and they ain't mineral water no more. They're actual mineral water, as in the real stuff. I want everybody out, roars Cantaloupe's. The witty guy translates. Nobody is going anywhere until we find out who the wise guy is who made off with our mineral water. Right, boss? Wrong, Cantaloupe snarls, pounding the bar with one large fish. fist. Somebody steals from Donnie Cantaloupe's and gets away with it. When I find out who's got my supply, I won't do anything in particular to them or their family. They'll walk away on two intact legs, with all their thumbs, and without a broken whiskey bottle in their keister. Uh, I love this. This is so delightful. Threats won't be necessary, Mr. Cantaloupes, the pro he says calmly. I'll see to it that your stolen property is recovered. I'll even let you say goodbye to it before we pour it into the sewer and arrest you. Some of the hotel guests, uh, oh, I lost it. Some of the hotel guests are slinking back to their rooms. You're not actually staying here. You started the night a few blocks away and sailed into the Grand Poseidon on a sea of gin. But you can't stand to be around of crowds of sober people, especially not when you're so unpleasantly clear-headed yourself. You make your way out into the lobby for some slightly fresher air. Hotel lobby. All right, now we're going to get some stuff going. The sumptuous entrance lobby of the Grand Poseidon Hotel. Aquamarine lights play over the leather couches and rich mahogany paneling, making the whole room look like it's underwater. Outside to the west, you can see the hustle and bustle of a Saturday night in downtown Seattle. In the center of the room is an enormous fish tank. To the north is the Neptune Lounge, which is crawling with a fuzz. To the south, past the front desk, is the hotel office, and a hallway leads east. A crystal column houses the elevator. A mermaid is swimming, swimming lazily around in the tank. Well, let's start taking a look. Uh, let's look at the tank. A huge cylindrical tank stretching from the floor to the ceiling. There's got to be about a million gallons of water in there. What about the mermaid? On closer inspection, 
Not actually a mermaid, just some blonde Sheba with a shiny fake tail wrapped around her gams and a couple of seashells stuck where they'll do her the most good. Her lung capacity must be positively amazing. The mermaid drifts down towards the bottom of the tank, then back up. I wonder if I can wave at the mermaid. You give a flirtatious little wave. The mermaid swims slowly in a sad circle. I wonder if I can talk to the mermaid. Talk to mermaid? She glances your way as you tap on the glass, but it doesn't look like she can hear you. All right. Um, so we've got outside to the west. We've got, well, let's see, can I go outside? The proies have the front door locked up tight. I guess you're staying here tonight. The mermaid blows a bubble. Um, let's go to the hotel office. The concierge appears, suggests perhaps Madam would prefer an area of the hotel that's not restricted to employees only and whisks away again. Looks like the hotel offices are off limits to guests. Alrighty. Then, uh, elevator, if I can type. A huge column molded to look like a water spout houses a pair of golden elevator doors. A pearl button used to call the elevator is just to the side. Well, let's push that button. You push the pearl button, but nothing happens. Maybe the operator got spooked by the raid? You should check again later. Well, that sounds like a hint. Uh, that just leaves us, uh, let me look again to make sure there's nothing here I want to take another look at. Um, let's look at the front desk. It stretches along the southern side of the lobby. You can see the hotel office past it. The mermaid drifts with the flow of the current. Well, let's go to the lounge. The party's over. Now the lounge is just a sad room full of bulls and sober people. You can't bear to see that now. All right, so... Let's look again. Uh, hallway leads east. Let's go east. As you step into the corridor, a faint shimmer passes across your field of vision, as if you've just looked through a slightly warped window. For a second, just one sweet second, you can almost taste champagne. First floor corridor. An east-west hall lined with pillars. Gilt-edged paintings decorate the walls. The hotel lobby lies to the west, and the scent of lightly chlorinated salt water drifts in from the east. Let's look at the paintings, and then head east. Subjects include sea serpents, sultry sirens, and ships being dragged to the inky depths. Well, let's keep going. The corridor seems to stretch as you walk down it. You feel your mouth filling with something cold but delicious. It's gin. Sweet, succulent gin. Only you can't seem to swallow it, or spit it out, and it's freezing. Your cheeks are already starting to feel numb. A woman in an old-fashioned dress, the sort your spinster -est spinster aunt would wear, is walking beside you, eyes fixed on the end of the hall. But the hall keeps going. And going. And your cheeks feel as if they're going to shatter from the cold. The woman whips her head around and fixes you with a stare, a pair of slate-gray eyes nailing into your own baby blues. And now you're stumbling out into the warm, steamy air of the... I never know how to say this word... Natatorium? Natatorium. Sure. Natatorium. The woman walks north, her back to you, and strides into the gentleman's changing room just as bold as anything. Natatorium. A huge room lined with pearly tiles. A stepped series of circular baths are laid out like tide pools, but one large saltwater pool dominates the room. The eastern wall is painted with a bright, sunny beach scene. The ladies' changing room is to the south, while gents have to head north. Well, I am going to follow the ghost because there's a ghost. You give the joint the once old, the old once over first, to, just to make sure nobody's watching, and then in you go. Jen's changing room. A snazzy locker room lined with gleaming brand new lockers, each emblazoned with a burnished copper number. The woman you saw coming in here is nowhere to be seen, but you can hear heavy breathing coming from one of the lockers. Number 77. Well, let's open it. As soon as your fingertips brush the handle, the locker bursts beneath your fingers like an overripe melon in the sun, flooding your vision with purple light. Okay, I'm glad I'm not the only person who does these kinds of transitions, as we saw in last week's Fragile Shells playthrough. You stand on a vast plain drenched in light from the pendulous purple suns hanging overhead. Neon squiggles slice across your eyes like razor worms. This world is cold and dry and your tongue feels like paper. The woman stands before you, a single dark spot in the brilliance, growing as the light drains into it, until she's all you can see and you're not even sure if you see that other world at all. There's a single moment of perfect silence. 
Then she explodes. You see things, dozens of creepy, crawly little things rushing toward you, crawling over you, wriggling across your skin like eels, and they feel like boneless dead things, but something about how they smell is appealing and familiar. We have but one choice. Let us inhale. You inhale deeply as the things rush past you, maybe a little too deeply. You feel dizzy. Then you feel the cement floor of the locker room smacking into the back of your head. Ugh. You're dimly aware that people are standing over you and thoughts drift through your mind. Idle concerns like that, like that you don't want people to think you're some wet dish rag who faints at the least little thing. And that you hope the blood isn't ruining your new cliché. And that maybe you're dying. You feel strong arms around you and now you're looking up into the face of an angel carrying you off to heaven. And apparently angels dress like elevator operators. And then it's off to slumberland for who knows how long. But at least long enough to cart you into another room because that's where you wake up. Specifically, you seem to be in a dark room, alone, lying on an uncomfortable cot made for someone shorter than you, lighter than you, and a whole lot less picky about where they park their person than you are. Well, let us stand up. You haul yourself up, feeling like you've just gone 10 rounds with Jack Dempsey after 10 rounds of Jack Daniels. Also a great joke. Unfortunately, the pleasant alcoholic haze is fading like a dream, while the just got the back of my head smashed in haze seems to be making itself right at home closet. The inside of a dimly lit storage closet, unfurnished except for an uncomfortable looking cot pushed into the corner. One whole wall is covered with newspaper clippings and a tower of dime novels teeters next to the cot. There's a door to the north. Well, pretty clearly, let's look at the clippings. The yellowing articles all describe ghost sightings, some as far away as Egypt and France, some not two blocks away. What about the dime novels? A stack of cheap, lurid pulp novels, the covers of which feature a whole bevy of women in disintegrating clothing being menaced by snaggly-toothed ghouls and glowing specters. Well, let's head out then. Well, let's check the column. Normally you wouldn't snuggle up in this creaky contraption even if it had Valentino in it, but being knocked unconscious really lowered your standards. So to the north, second floor corridor, right in the middle. You're standing around the midpoint of a long hall that runs the length of the Grand Poseidon second floor. There's a small closet to the south, and the hallway continues to the east and west. Well, I'll just pick a direction. Let's go east. We're at the east end. You're standing at the eastern end of a long hall that runs the length of the Grand Poseidon second floor. Doors to the north and south lead to luxury suites, and the hallway continues to the west. Let's see if we can go to any of the luxury suites. Ooh, the Arctic Suite. This room doesn't look like it's been used in years. Everything's covered in a thick coal of, coat of dust, the benzedrine bottles scattered on the floor, the drafting table shoved in the corner, and most especially the enormous scale model of the Poseidon Hotel which dominates the room. A typewritten note is affixed to the model. Let's read that note. From the desk of Roland Stork Architectural Genius. <laughs> oh, this makes me happy. Dear thieving pieces of excrement, from the day the first man took tool in hand and brick by brick built a palace for his inferiors, the noble architect has toiled to provide comfort and civilization to the filthy subhuman masses who despise him for his talents. Thus so was it with the latest chapter in this age-old tragedy in which I, I, who set my glorious brain to laying the very foundations on which you crawl, you purulent, pus-sucking larvae, was hired to design a hotel under the express condition that not one detail of my art be defiled by pointless, mindless, stupid changes. It burst forth from the loins of my hands, <laughs> loins of my hands, and mind as perfection, a true masterpiece. And was my masterpiece built properly, as agreed? No, says the man at the planning office. You can't build a structure this size out of gingerbread. No, says the man on the construction crew. We're going to use stone and cement instead. No, says the man at the front desk. You can't build a gigantic scale model in your room midway through construction. How will we ever get it out? We didn't give you our permission. Well, I didn't give permission for my designs to be stained by the crude droolings of a bunch of single-celled parasitic idiot orangutans. You took my rights from me, and I shall take my hotel from your, you. The gift I've hidden in my room will soon blast your brains into the lifeless goop they are. This page is labeled 1 of 147, but the others seem to be missing. All right, I am here for some Ayn Rand dragging. I am here for it. Love it, love it, love it. All right, uh, let's look at the model. 
Uh, a 110 scale model of the Poseidon Hotel, which takes up nearly all of the space in the room, and oddly enough, looks like it's been put down together entirely of gingerbread. <laughs> it's otherwise perfect down to the smallest detail. The doors are just big enough to squeeze in. Well, let's go in. You manage to squeeze yourself through the tiny front doors and into a perfect model of the hotel. Gingerbread Hotel Lobby. You're crouching on your hands and knees in a perfect stale gingerbread recreation of the hotel's lobby. It should be just be possible to crawl north or east, crawl out again, or go up the elevator shaft. Well, we gotta go up. You push your way up the elevator shaft and scoot into the second floor hall. Gingerbread second floor corridor. You're lying on your stomach in a recreation of the second floor corridor. It's a very tight squeeze, and you can't do much in here besides sliding back down. However, one of the gingerbread doors has opened a crack to the northeast. Let's see if we can look through the door. You can get your head through the door, but that's it. Your shoulders are too wide, and forget about points south. Gingerbread Arctic Suite. Your head is sticking into a recreation of the Arctic Suite. You can scooch back to the southwest. You can see a scale model of the scale model of the Poseidon Hotel here. I was hoping for this. A smaller model of the model you're currently inside, also made of gingerbread. This one has wires coming out of it, and it's ticking in a frankly kind of worrying way. A big red candy button on the hotel's face is marked Emergency Diffuse. I wonder if I can push that button. You can't reach it from here. You can get your hands just about far enough in the room to touch your face, and that's it. Gee, if only your tongue was a foot longer. For lots of reasons. All right, uh, that's clearly a puzzle that we're going to have to deal with a little bit later. So let's back out. Uh, let's see if there's anything north or east. Uh, Neptune Lounge. You're on your hands and knees in a gingerbread recreation of the Neptune Lounge. You can back out to the south. And to the east, the gingerbread natatorium. You're on your hands and knees in a gingerbread recreation of the hotel natatorium. The pool has been faithfully recreated in blue buttercream frosting. You can head back out to the west. All right. Well, I will leave that for later. Let's check the bottles. Someone must have really been burning the midnight oil. Staying up all night, you can understand. But staying up all night to work? Uh, let's check the table. Looks like an ordinary drafting table. Sure. Uh, okay. We will leave that for later. Let's go south. The Indian suite. You can barely see this suite beneath the drop cloth on the floor and the host of half-finished canvases leaning against every wall. The second floor hallway is to the north. Crispin Formant slouches at an easel, staring at a blank canvas with a tortured expression on his face. A smallish display table sits a few feet from the easel. On it is an uninspiring bowl. A bland, boring bowl. No artist could possibly be inspired by this. Let's talk to Crispin. Crispin looks up at you. His gorgeous peepers have lost their smolder, and his complexion is pale and drained. Go away, he moans. I don't deserve admirers. I'm no artist. Why would you say that? Look how they laud me. Look how they applaud. Look how they clap and cheer for me when I am but a fraud. A joke. A piglet of pigment. Crispin looks sadly at the blank canvas. I want to be a real artist, but I can only paint dames. So paint dames. Ha! My populist crap claptrap period is over. Never another dame shall spill from this brush, for I now only paint real art. And real art means but one thing. Bowls of fruit. So paint fruit? I only wish I could. Crispin sighs deeply. And yet every container I find is so uninspiring. A true artist would be inspired. A true artist would capture the hell out of that bowl. He sighs again. I, I am not a true artist. Uh, who says bowls of fruit are only the real art? They all say that. Every real artist, Crispin says glumly. He hands you a thick art history textbook. It's right here in black and white. Read it for yourself. I used to scoff at the opinion of my betters, but, but tonight for some reason... I just can't stop thinking about what a failure of an artist I am. Uh, why not paint what you like? I would never be accepted. They'd all keep laughing at me behind my back. Let's see what kind of container would inspire. Oh, maybe something with a bowlish, vaseish, dishish quality. Maybe in blue. No, white. No, red. And maybe if it were large or small, 
He puts his head in his hands. I just can't think of what kind of container I should put the fruit in, but, but I know if I saw the right container on that table, I would be inspired. Well, good luck, Crispin. Crispin sighs and goes back to staring at the canvas. Um, all right, so there's clearly another puzzle that we're going to need to deal with. Let's go to the west. Second floor corridor, west end. You're standing at the western end of a long hall that runs the length of the Grand Poseidon's second floor. Doors to the north and south lead to luxury suites. The hallway continues to the east. This is also the second floor elevator stop, and you can push the pearl button to summon an elevator. Well, I need to go to more luxury suites is what I need to do. North. Ah, says a voice as you enter the darkened room. The spirits inform me that a new seeker has arrived. That is well. Eight is a very powerful number in the tongue of the Orient. Ugh, twenties. Uh, Eight holds the same meaning as life. Come, join us, pilgrim. Sit in this chair. A little bit of a hint there. Take our hands and help us breach the very veil between this life and the next. As your eyes begin to adjust to the darkness, you see figures seated around a table. Looks like you wandered into a real live seance. Ain't that just the elephant's manicure? The Atlantic Suite. The room is dark, the air thick with the smell of incense and burning spices. Half a dozen men and women are gathered around a table in the center of the room, holding hands, their eyes closed. The door back to the hall is to your south. Madam Ping Ping sits at the far end side of the table, hands clasped with the other seance goers, eyes closed in concentration. Directly across from her is an inviting looking tasseled chair. Well, let's sit in a chair, how about? The room is dark, do 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 do. You ease yourself into the comfortable tasseled chair and join hands with the seance goers to either side of you. Across from you, Madam Ping Ping clears her throat and the seance resumes. Spirit, Madam Ping Ping says, we beseech you to show your presence. Let's see if there's a spirit. Nope. Knock once on the table, spirit. Let's look at that table. A round table, perfect for dancing on, covering with drinks, or in a very distant third place, holding a seance around, apparently. The seance goers mumble their agreement. Let's look at those seance goers. Uh, that's something I need to fiddle with. That's all right. All it will take is one knock. We must know you are here. Let's listen. You hear nothing unexpected. Knock, spirit! Knock on the table! Let's wait again. Spirit, Madam Ping Ping says, we beseech you to show your presence. All right, so this sounds like something else we need to figure out how to uh, deal with. I wonder if I can, let's see, if I can knock on the table. <laughs> You're holding hands with the people to either side, and if you let go their shirts and smell something fishy, knock! Knock, the assembled seance goers repeat. I wonder if I can knee the table? Kick table, maybe? Nope. Uh, you know what? Let's see if there was uh, a command. Talk to, eat, drink, wear, take off, push, turn, read. This is what I do when I'm stuck is I start looking at help and commands and things. Push, turn, read, blow, open, close, put in, sit in, enter, get in, stand, heal, toe tap. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and stand. You let go to the hands of either of you and you stand up. Um, let's go back south and then south again. The Pacific Suite. An ordinary hotel room, neat as a pen. It doesn't look like anyone's staying in this one. A scenic picture hangs over the freshly made bed. The only exit is north, back the way you came. Let's look at that picture. It depicts a pirate ship sailing across rough seas. The pirates happily hoisting mugs of grog. You sure could go for some grog right now, and you're not even sure what it is. Well, I could go for some water. Uh, look behind picture. I wonder if I can take it. Oh, it's not something I need to fiddle with. Let's look at the bed. It sure looks cozy. This sort of bed a freshly schnockered girl could happily collapse into in happier times. All right. Uh, let's push the button. The elevator doors slide open, and there's the elevator operator, some cute little Sheba in a fancy aquamarine uniform, young enough that she's probably still got a handprint on her hindquarters from where the doctor slapped her. Oh, good, she chirps when you, she sees you. You're awake. Gosh, did you ever take a real wackadoo, wackaroo on the noggin? Uh, and how my head is still pounding. 
She nods. That's one of the 30 telltale signs of a genuine ghostly encounter. Residual aches in the head, spine, shoulders, legs, or fundament, dizziness, sallow complexion, general biliousness, distemper, soul rot, flashbacks, blackouts, inversion of balance, ennui, malaise, fever, generalized pox, itching, bloating, excessive perspiration, not enough perspiration, wandering tongue. Ghostly encounter? Oh yes, this hotel is haunted, you know. All sorts of horrible things happened here. She beams at you. You were covered with spectral residue when we found you. Everyone else said that was just gunk from the locker room floor, but I knew the truth. I knew you'd touched the other world. Kiddo, the only thing I want to touch right now is an ice pack and a few drinks to empty into it. Sorry, miss, but there's not a drop in the whole place. I think that's the work of the ghost, too, because I know who the ghost is. She leans forward and sticks out one white-gloved hand. Kipper Fanucci, student of the paranormal. It's me, I mean, not the ghost. Hazel Green, student of the alcoholic. Nice to meet you, Hazel. Kipper pumps your hand up and down vigorously. I can't believe I'm finally meeting someone with the sight. Oh, I have to ask, what is the sight? It means you can see into the spiritual realm, at least a little bit. More than I can anyway, she murmurs, a wistful look crossing her face. You ought to treasure it. It's a rare gift. Who is the ghost? Her name is Mildred Waverly. She was a temperance crusader who disappeared in this very hotel eight years ago tonight, give or take a couple of weeks, and her body was never found. There have been events for years. Drinks mysteriously going bad, strange sounds coming from the basement, but never anything like this. So this blue nose from beyond the grave has got us all stuck in a bone-dry haunted house and I'm the only one who can see her? Kipper nods vigorously. Now you're on the trolley. She pulls a battered pair of old-fashioned, wire-rimmed cheaters out of her pocket. Take a gander at these. I thought she was going to put them on. They were found in Mildred Waverly's room on the night she disappeared. She wore them everywhere, which means, according to Epstein's principle of sympathetic resonance, they should be attuned to her. They might make it easier to find spectral traces. I've been looking through them all day, but if you don't have the sight, they're just a pair of old glasses. Go ahead, try them on. Maybe you'll see something. I bet we'll see something. This still sounds like a barrel of banana oil to you, but you may as well humor the kid. You slip the glasses on and... There's a mysterious patch on the wall of the elevator, a sort of glowing, greasy stain of light. It twists and quivers, seeming to sense that you're taking a gander at it, and finally peels away and reforms and... Holy smokes, there's a ghost here! There's a ghost right here, looking at you with its little piggy ghostly eyes, making itself comfortable with a nice perch right on Kipper's shoulder. You take off the cheaters and rub your eyes, but the ghost is still there. Looks like once they decide to come out to play, you don't need the glasses to see them. Let's take a look at that ghost. It looks like a splash of liquid, like the moment when a drink got dumped out or tossed in someone's face was frozen forever. When it sees that you, you're looking at it, it vamps like Clara Bow. Let's ask Kipper about Ghost. You want to hear more about Mildred Waverly? Sure. According to Winslow, Winslow's three precepts, a paranormal entity intersects the physical plane when one of Brezhnev's five conditions is met, and going by rule of least co-corporeality. I love how ghost hunters, uh, especially in this era, have so many rules. Boy, this Sheba can beat her gums when she gets going. Let's talk to Ghost or open Ghost. Oh, we need to try to open the Ghost. That's not something you can open. Use your head. You suggested it. Let's talk to the Ghost. The Ghost just giggles wetly. Well, I think we're about to send a spirit into the seance. Ghost, go north. The ghost isn't listening to you and probably has no sense of direction anyway. Hello, sailor. The ghost is unimpressed by your flirting. Let's see if I can take the ghost. You can't seem to get a grip on it. It's like trying to hold on to a damp tissue in a dream. Smell ghost. It smells a lot like a bucket of gin. Well, I think we know what our character would do. Drink ghost. You lunge forward. You put your lips on the ghost and suck in, not really expecting it to work any better than anything else you've tried. But to your shock, it does. You slurp the ghost, shrieking down your gullet. Not only did that get rid of the ghost, you really needed that drink. Apparently, this is how you get rid of ghosts. Who knew? See, because they're, they're spirits. I gotcha. I'm there. You draw back to see Kipper goggling at you. What was that? One of those kisses they do to say hello in France? She blushes. Gee, I've never been French kissed before. Solid, solid joke. No, I wasn't trying to kiss you. I was drinking a ghost off of your shoulder. We sound like we have a firm grasp of reality. 
Kipper rolls her eyes. Sure, like I haven't heard that line before. Wait, you're serious, aren't you? You actually succeeded in enclosing a second order roaming malevolent subspirit in an organic containment matrix? Oh, Miss Green, that's just the cat's pajamas. You don't just have the sight, you have the taste. She practically pushes you out of the elevator. You put on these glasses and see what else you can find. I bet this place is just dripping with second order roaming malevolent subspirits. Oh, gosh, this is exciting. All right. Now that we've got glasses, uh, let's go here. Uh, wear glasses. You slip them on. It's downright criminal to block the world's view of your kisser, but you've got to find where those ghosts are hiding. Uh, I don't see anyone here. What about in the seance? Uh, what happens if I sit? Oh, sit in chair. Uh, I don't see any spirits. So let's... Uh, a pair of spook spotting cheaters being worn, an art theory textbook, your best set of glad rags being worn. If the right dress makes you feel like a million bucks, this little black number makes you feel like Rockefeller's bank account. And much like Rockefeller's bank account, it generates plenty of interest. You found it in the sale bin at Komodo's, but nobody needs to know that. Top it with an antique pearl necklace you nabbed from the old lady's dresser, and just the right cloche perched on top of your perfect bobbed golden curls, and you could get away with murder. Uh, this is about ghosts, so is that a possibility? I don't know. All right. Uh, let's go back to the closet. Um, so I wonder if the ghost will be stuck to furniture, because that was it was stuck to the elevator, the one that we just got rid of. Uh, so I'm going to look at things in this room, which is the cot and the novels and the clippings. Ooh. Let's look at the specters. Nope. All right. Clippings. Uh, ghost sightings. So clearly, uh, our friend Kipper's room. Let's... A laundry... Haha, <laughs> here's something. A laundry cart trundles slowly along the edge of the hallway, brass wheel squeaking. You can see a mysterious glow coming from the cart. Maybe if you took a closer look. I really appreciate uh, that Steph is making it clear the kinds of actions that we need to take to keep things moving along so that we don't get stuck on things that aren't actually puzzles that we're trying to solve. I also like that in the ghost interaction um, where we were given things to do and uh, that let us move forward to show us what we're going to be doing with the ghosts without us having to flail around and guess what to do with the ghosts. So let's look at that glow. Uh, maybe the cart then. The cart, already piled high, prowls as if looking for more dirty laundry to add to its haul. I need that cart. You wish you could show this to the old lady. She's always claiming laundry doesn't do itself. Your spook-spotting cheaters reveal the source of the mysterious movement. This thing is possessed. Now, if only you can find a way to satisfy this laundry cart's unfinished business. All right, so it's looking for dirty laundry. Uh... Let's look at the model. Ooh, you spy an odd glow coming from one of the upper windows out of your reach. So let's go in, and if it's the upper windows, then I'll need to go up the shaft and then northeast. Uh, let's model. The model is inhabited by a ghost. All right, so this is another thing that we're going to need to do something with if as soon as I can figure out... Uh, what to do there? The glow coming from... The crisp informant slouches as an easel. He appears to be possessed by one of the hotel ghosts. Let's uh, examine informant then. And no... Oh, he's that local artist you nearly had a brush with down in the lounge. Only now the fellow looks positively grummy. And no wonder his chest is glowing like a pan of hot coals. He's got a ghost in him. So this is another thing that we're going to need to solve. Um, let's see... Was there anything else in here? Bed, picture. Uh, oh, Madam Ping Ping. A plump woman about your mother's age, dressed in a shimmering Chinese dress and a silken cape. Her black wig looks like it came from a Cleopatra fancy dress costume. It looks like she's possessed by a ghost. Can I talk to Ping Ping? Madam Ping Ping ignores you. Okay, so we've got... Uh, Not sure what to 
do at this point. Uh, so we've got the cart. So uh, I wonder if, so we need laundry from somewhere. Um, all right, are these the only places I can go? What, what happens if I push the button? Oh, first floor, third floor, see a kipper. Hiya, Miss Green, where to now? Let's go to the third floor. Sure thing, third floor. It's real swanky up here, and there's a big door to the east that looks like it's got to be a private suite. A smaller door is to the west. Just like with the other elevator stops, you can push the pearl button here to call Kipper. A stone-faced palooka stands at attention next to the door. Uh, let's look at the palooka. He's eyeing you suspiciously, which has got to be one of your least favorite ways to be eyed. Let's talk to him. He just growls at you. I guess this mook's not much for chit-chat. All right, so I'm guessing he won't let me go through. Nope. The stone-faced palooka holds up a hand. This is a private suite, see toots? Nobody gets in here but the boss. The boss's gal and the boss's employees what work for his establishment. Now, Scramola. So that suggests that I'm going to need to dress like an employee to get into there. Uh, smaller door to the west? What's in there? Damp closet. This is nothing but a small, dark, cramped, damp closet. A metal hatch is set into a particularly wet patch of carpet. Ugh. Let's look at that hatch. It's made of metal and about two feet on the side. Can I open hatch? You swing the heavy metal hatch open, revealing water about a foot down. Light glints in the depths. Let's look at that light. Uh, maybe water? I wonder if I can go down. You're not dressed for a dip. Suggests another thing that I'm going to need to do. Uh, so let's, that's the third floor. Let's go to the first floor. We're back in the hotel lobby. Uh, fish tank, the elevator. Uh, let's look at the tank. A huge cylindrical tank. Straight, yep. So the mermaid is gone. Um, so that was for decoration. She was um, adding points of interest in the first parts. So um, let's try going back. First floor corridor, east-west guild paintings. Um, nothing about the paintings. Natatorium. Um, all right. We've not been to the ladies' changing room. It's steamy and musty with slick floors. Lockers line the walls. You can see a stinky stocking here. Well, whoo! Smells like someone wore this to cut a rug on the hottest day of July after winning an onion eating slash bath, bath avoiding biathlon and then stuffed it in her brassiere for a month. Which is all by way of saying, you've smelled fresher. Let's, let's get it. I'm guessing it needs a laundry cart. You pick it up gingerly between two fingers. Ugh. All right. Uh, let's go back into the gents. One of the lockers is blackened, the closed doors bulging and twisted as if it's been through a fire. It's charcoal black and twisted slightly out of shape. The number is missing, but you can see bare patches, which look like a pair of sevens. The closed metal door bulges strangely, as if something is trapped behind it. Well, let's check that out. Uh, open locker, I mean. The locker is tightly sealed. Whatever's beyond it is still too strong. Uh, okay, so... Locker, west, west, um, it's in the lounge. All right, a real fancy place for swells to come and take in a show. Crystal chandeliers, napkins folded in the shape of a fish, the whole kit and caboodle. One wall is mostly taken up by a bar that serves juice. Another features a stage that serves up talented performers. And the third is dominated by an enormous mural. The hotel lobby is to the south, the dressing room is to the north, and double doors lead east to the kitchen. A discarded party blower lies on the floor. A dejected daiquiri sits abandoned on one of the tables. Uh, let's look at that blower. It's one of those uncurling party favors you can blow. Ha ha! That's why it was blow was in the list of verbs. That you can blow to make a wee noise. Get blower. Taken. Blow it. You pop it in your mouth and blow. The paper part uncoils with surprising force and a nice loud wee noise. You feel a little more festive. I have an idea of what we can do with that. Well, I'll try it out here in a minute. Uh, let's examine the daiquiri. A single banana bobs fruitlessly in the non-alcoholic misery sauce. You can't bear to see this. You reach in and pluck it from its watery grave, then put the rest of the drink out of its misery by tossing it over your shoulder. So we now have a banana. Banana. A little smile of sunshine, popular with chimpanzees and people walking in front of Oliver Hardy. <laughs> Again. Excellent joke. Um, let's see. So we can go dressing room to the north. 
Props and costumes are scattered around this small dressing room. A full-length mirror leans against the wall. South leaves back to Neptune Lounge. A large wooden crate sits against one wall. A handwritten reminder is pasted to the wall. Let's read that reminder. All right, Numbskull, you're in charge of this leg of the tour. Don't screw it up. All you got to do is get a few commands for your thick head, and the dog does the rest, see? Remember, set him down first. He won't do this stuff if you're carrying him. Heel tap to make him sing, toe tap to make him dance. Don't get him mixed up, and don't let the marks get wise to what you're really doing. We want him to think the dog's smarter than they are instead of just smarter than you are. Oh, and remember not to lock the crate, dummy. You put him in anything lock, he'll just break it and get out. You keep it nailed shut. He can't get out of that. Oh yeah, and whatever you do, don't click your heels. If I ever find out it was you that taught him that trick, I'll wring your scrawny little chicken neck and nail you to the wall. Got it, you puke-faced mug? Love, mother. Well, let's look at that crate. A wooden crate covered in stickers from exotic ports of call. It's securely nailed shut, and you hear a sad whine coming from within. Oh, doggy. It just might be possible to work the top loose from outside if you really put your back into it, but it'd probably involve a whole lot of unladylike grunting. Well, we're going to open that crate. A whole lot of unladylike grunting later, as promised. You've got the top open a crack, and that's about all this little pooch needed. You see a pair of furry paws slip into the crack, expertly working at the new weakness, and suddenly, kerpowzo! The crate collapses into kindling, and a fluffy little fur ball explodes out of the wreckage. Barnaby Mooch, the magnificent pooch, is free at last, and he's using his freedom to lick your face, which is fine by you because there was some unladylike sweating involved, too. A tiny terrier with stylishly bobbed round fur and more brains than Dr. Frankenstein's icebox. Okay, so let's, uh, let me think about this for a second. That was heel tap. You tap your heel and Barnaby Mooch howls sweet Adeline. Uh, there was toe tap. You tap your toes and Barnaby Mooch leaps into the air. Uh, I think I know how I'm going to get a knock out of the seance. Um, what about click heels? You click your heels together. At first, nothing seems to happen. Then you smell the oh-so-unmistakable scent of rotten eggs, and Barnaby Mooch looks up at you with a sheepish expression. This mutt's just violated the Geneva gas protocol. Uh, I'm going to get you, mutt. Uh, oh, I wonder, will he follow me? Barnaby barks happily and lets you scoop him up in your arms. So we are now carrying Barnaby Mooch, the magnificent pooch. Uh, any props? Um, wooden swords, wooden crowns, wooden crowns. The perfect complement to wooden acting. Great if you were going to shake your moneymaker on stage, but right now about as useful as a mime with a megaphone. Uh, let's look at the costumes. And there's a dazzling variety of outfits of every description. Unfortunately, they belong to the traveling troupe of Ingrid von Vast, the burliest woman on earth, and Teacup Tommy, the tiny Tijuanan tumbler, and so none of them are anywhere close to your size. Uh, can I get them? Probably not, but I'll try. Nope. I also appreciate clearly indicating that these are things that are there for flavor and not hiding something that I need to worry about doing. All right. Uh, so I've gone to the dressing room. I have not gone to the kitchen. And the concierge appears, suggests perhaps Madame would prefer an area of the hotel that's not restricted to employees only, and whisks away again. Looks like the kitchen is off limits to guests. So there are a couple of areas that are off limits to guests, I noticed. Um, let's see, that was the Neptune Lounge. There's the hotel lobby. Uh, I've got the sock. Uh, I still can't go south because, yep. Uh, I would need some sort of, ooh, push button. So let's go see if I, there are things I can do now. Uh, so back to the second floor. First, let's see what happens. Um, put dog under table. Drop dog. Party B hops out of your arms. Um, so let's see if I sit in the chair... Um, it looks like the seance is still going through. Ha! <laughs> um, you drop Barnaby in order to have both hands free and then ease yourself into the comfortable tasseled chair. He saunters under the table and parks himself loyally at your feet as you join hands with the seance goers to either side of you. Across from you, Madame Ping Ping clears her throat and the seance resumes. All right. So, as I recall, toe tap is jump, heel tap is sing, and uh, heel... Clicking is for farting. 
So let's wait. All it will take is one knock. So, toe tap. You tap your toes and Barnaby Mooch leaps into the air. Unfortunately, the poor kid didn't reckon on anything being in the way, and he bashes his tender coconut into the underside of the table with a loud knocking noise. The seance goers gasp. He knocks, Madam Ping says. The ghost shows his presence. Oh, spirit, speak. I beseech you in the name of Samurai, allow us to hear your mournful voice. Oh, spirit, speak to us, Madam Ping Ping cries. Well, that's a heel tap. You tap your heel, and Barnaby Mooch lets out a mournful howl. The spirit cries out in pain, Madam Ping Ping cries. The guests murmur amongst them. <coughs> Excuse me. The guests murmur among them, amongst themselves, worried. Are we quite completely sure this is a good spirit? Asks the nervous woman. Not one from, one from down there. You must abandon such western ways and embrace the spirit of the honorable east. <sighs> Madam Ping Ping chides. Do not the ancestors wash away such distinctions when their spirit travels? spirits travel to Mount Fuji to bathe in the headwaters of the Yangtze? She glances around the circle. Ah, but I see you have not progressed far enough along the eightfold path to abandon such earth earthly conceits. Very well, I shall now ask the spirit to prove it comes not from any underworld, but from the ambrosia-soaked rice fields of the honorable deceased. Ease our minds, spirit, Madam Ping wails. Show us you mean us well. Well, let's clear this all out. You click your heels together. A few seconds later, the air fills with the scent of rotten eggs. Brimstone! Screams the nervous young woman sitting next to you, releasing her hand. Help! Help! It's a demon! A demon! Shouts the man with the walrus mustache, fumbling with a cross. I knew this was a stupid idea! It's come for our souls! Not our souls! The nervous woman screams. Go away, demon! I'll never dabble in the occult again! Madam Ping Ping abruptly stops ululating. Now, there's no need to go that far, but it's too late. An umbrella clobbers the medium on the back of her head as a woman in the, a dark coat vaults over the table and scrambles toward the door. It's locked, dark coat babbles, turning the knob the wrong way. Walrus Mustache lifts the tasseled chair off the carpet. I'll soon have it down, he growls. Excuse me, Mac, you say, hanging onto the armrest for dear life. <laughs> nice. This seat's taken. You want to give me a chance to vacate the premises? Uh... You want me to give me a chance to vacate the premises before you go all Samson on the place? Seeing the answer is apparently no, you leap free just before the chair is sent hurtling through the door. The seance goers rush out in a blind panic, leaving you flat on your keister, the room in a shambles, and Madam Ping Ping sprawled unconscious across the table. A gurgling ghost billows up out of her body. You're lucky you can blame this one on the dog. Uh, uh, let's find that ghost. <laughs> the room is dark, the air thick with the smell of incense, burning spices, and just a hint of dog wind. Uh, the ghost looks like a pint of delicious booze come to life. Let's drink that ghost. You put your lips on the ghost and gulp it down. Mmm, this stuff is positively the berries. It only takes a few swallows before the spectral killjoy is gone for good, and the hotel is just a little less haunted. Gee, don't it feel swell to do a good deed? All right. Uh, so that's one down. Let's go back to the end of the corridor. There's the glow coming from the cart. And I picked up this stinky stocking. Put stocking on cart. The cart accepts the repulsive thing with ecstasy. Taking such a wretched little rag to be washed must be a laundry cart's dream. With a lurch, it overturns, spilling undergarments, towels, and a fancy bellhop's uniform out of the onto the floor. And then a ghost erupts from the piles of laundry. Let's look at that ghost. It looks like a pint of delicious booze. They all look the same. They're very undifferentiated ghosts. Well, let's drink that one. You smack your lips against the ectoplasmic creep and take a good long slurp. Pretty soon, the ghost has been sent to that big old bloodstream in the sky. Too bad these little things don't have sheets, or you'd have three of them to be to the wind right now. All right. Uh, so we've got the uniform. Now, here's what I'm thinking about the party blower. There's the button that we can't reach, but we can stick our head in in the model of the model of the hotel. And you can reach your hands up to your face, which means I can put the party blower up there and blow it and unfurl it. So we're going to go uh, enter model. Then we're going to go upstairs and northeast into the gingerbread Arctic suite. Um... Uh, let's see, model of the model. It's inhabited by a ghost. Big red candy button. Um, 
Let's see. Yeah, so you can't reach it from here. You can only get your hands just about far enough into the room to touch your face. And only if your tongue was about a foot longer. So, blow, blower. You fish out the party blower, work your hand far enough into the room to pop it into your mouth, and blow. The paper roll is just long enough to smack the candy-colored button dead center, depressing it and shutting off the bomb. A ghost bubbles out of the bomb, sloshes around in the tiny room, and pours out the window into the other, bigger Arctic suite. So, southwest to get out, then down, and then out. A smug-looking ghost. Let's look at that ghost. Well, smug-looking ghost, you drunk. You're starting to get the hang of this. The ghost goes down the hatch faster than a sailor who just heard Clara Bow was birthed in his bunk. It's going to turn out I'm mispronouncing that name. I'm sorry. And with four drinks in you, you're starting to feel nicely haunted. All right. We have a bellhop's uniform, which means we can now get into areas that we couldn't before. You really ought to take off the glad rags before putting anything else on. There's got to be a better place to get changed, somewhere where you won't be on the hook for causing heart attacks if someone gets an eyeful. Well, I know where that is. That is downstairs. So, uh, south, west, west, push button to get Kipper down to the first floor. Then it is east, east, south, ladies' changing room. I wonder if I can just change into uniform. Nope. Uh, remove rags. You shuck off your dress, hat, and pearls. Wear uniform. You shrug on the uniform and do up the buttons. Anyone who sees you would take you for an unusually good-looking hotel employee. You're dressed as a grand Poseidon bellhop, but you don't plan on carrying anyone's bags tonight. All right. Uh, places I could not get before. Um, let's see. We need to go back from the hotel lobby. Oh, so now I should be able to go into the hotel office. Cleverly disguised as the Grand Poseidon's most beautiful bellhop, <clears throat> you hop over the counter and into an employee's only area. Hotel office. Oof. This room's a real step down in the fanciness, fanciness department. Looks like everyone's cleared out after the raid, leaving nothing but a room full of desks and paperwork. The lobby is to the north. To the east is the door to the hotel's high security vault. There's an apple sitting on one of the desks. Uh, get apple. That's a piece of fruit <coughs> that our artist friend might enjoy. The apple is all bright and shiny. The desk must have belonged to a real apple polisher. Excellent. Uh, let's see if we can go into the vault. Vault. This is the hotel's vault, where guests can drop off their high-priced losables so they can debauch in peace. Nobody's at the teller's window, but the vault door has a deposit slot for after-hour drop-offs. You can see a ghostly outline moving around beyond the vault door. Let's look at that ghost. Um, slot, maybe? It's big enough to fit most hoity-toity valuables, up to and including crystal skulls and rhinestone-studded bowling balls, while being slightly too small for the typical urchin or daring midget contortionist. Um, let's look at the window. A caged window where the teller would stand if the teller were, was here, which the teller isn't. You can see a, a few valuables tagged and numbered on the back shelves, but there's absolutely no way to reach them. I wonder if I can put my hand in the slot. Reach through slot. <clears throat> All right, so there's a ghost here. <clears throat> I probably need to put something into the um, the slot. So what am I going to put in there? All right. It's too small for me. It's indicating that I can't put my, my hand in. Uh, <clears throat> oh, ha. Huh. You know who busts out of any container they're put in? Barnaby Mooch. Uh, I think we need the dog again. All right. So the other thing we can do, let's see. In the lounge, I could not go. No, I already went into the kitchen. I never didn't examine the refrigerator. This refrigerator, much like the old lady that time she chaperoned your senior year homecoming dance, is sitting in the corner, humming quietly, and radiating bitter cold. <laughs> That's excellent. The refrigerator is closed. Open it. You swing the heavy door open and get a blast of arctic air in the face. A lone orange rests on the top shelf. Let's get it. And examine it. For making vodka and orange juice, except there's no vodka, 
What are people supposed to do for breakfast tomorrow? Um, I think our main character has a drinking problem. I'm a little concerned. So let's look again. Uh, let's look at the counters. All right, don't need to worry about that. So I have an apple. I have an orange for the artist. Um, I have the idea for Barnaby Mooch. The other thing I can do now is go up to the third floor. Uh, was there anything in here? Uh, <laughs> hatch. Huh. Right, so I can go, but I'm not dressed for it yet. Let's go in. Ha! That's how I can go for a dip. Since the palooka now opens the door for me. The Imbrium Suite. This swanky pi private suite makes everything on the floor below look like yesterday's day old donuts. White leather couches, silver fittings, wall-to-wall -wall carpeting so plush you could sink into it like quicksand. A pair of goldfish float languidly in a crystal aquarium on the coffee table. There's a bedroom to the east, and the suite exit is to the west. It's a sweet, sweet exit. A mermaid get-up is tossed carelessly on the floor. Well, they definitely want that. It's a pair of scaly trousers with a coppery sheen and gauzy fins on the bottom cuffs. The illusion of a tail is created by swimming with your legs clamped together. There's also a bra made of a couple of seashells just big enough for you to, to keep you from being hauled away by the vice squad. So there were couches. Who boy, talk about swanky seats. Fittings. Uh, I don't need to fiddle with the fittings. What about the carpeting? It's pure white and so soft it's like walking on marshmallows. Um, let's look at the goldfish. The fish stare limpidly at you. And the aquarium. It contains 100 gallons of water and two goldfish. Um, weirdly specific. Master bedroom. Hot dog. Now this is a bedroom. It's about the size of a barn with a huge four-poster bed slathered with shimmering draperies plopped right in the middle. The rest of the suite opens up to the west. Gams Gillespie is here combing her hair at the vanity. Gams Gillespie. This is the famous Gams Gillespie, former chorus girl and current girlfriend of Donnie Cantaloupes. Dressed in a diaphanous dressing gown, she's seated at a vanity combing out her long, damp blonde hair. It looks like she's possessed by a ghost! Let's talk to Gams. Gams Gillespie stops brushing her hair and looks up at you. What do you want? I didn't call for no room service. You look a little blue. Well, what do you expect when I spend all evening underwater in that damn fish suit getting my anemones ogled for the edification of Donnie's paying customers? It's cold in there. I keep telling him to put a heater in, in it, but no, she sighs. Anyway, I got a bigger problem than a little goose flesh. What kind of problem? A love problem, that's what kind, she cries, clutching the hairbrush to her chest. It it haunts me, almost like a literal ghost or something. It's very on the nose. I wish there was something you could do, but it just ain't the sort of thing a kid like you could understand. Try me, I've been around the block a few times. You ain't even been out of the garage, baby face, but all right. It's like this. You know how when a couple is together for a long time, they sort of drift apart. He's off doing his thing and she's off doing her thing. And pretty soon all the passion just wheezes out of the whole relationship like a fallen souffle. And one day she looks around at her beautiful, expensive home and realizes she ain't been given the business in a marital kind of way. I mean, since who knows when, if you get what I'm saying, she pauses a moment to make sure you get what she's saying. Anyway, it so happens this exact situation has befallen a certain pair of lovebirds I know who shall rename, remain nameless. I need some way to spice things up. One of those you know, what do you call them? Acromegliacs. Aphrodisiacs? She brightened. Yeah, those. You run down in the kitchen and get me one of them aphrodisiacs for the couple I know. And what sort of aphrodisiacs am I looking for again? Something romantical. Something like the meal Donia and I had on our first anniversary. Just a pile of boiled oysters. No spices or nothing. They called it oysters and more. She sighs and flutters eyelashes. It was magical. Um, tell me about this other couple. Oh, well, I ain't naming any names or nothing, so let's just call them Mr. and Mrs. X. They've been together for, oh, a while now, and things aren't going so great. But Mr. X just needs a little shot of spice in the old watch McCann, and he'll be all ready for romance again. I just know it. How did you and Donnie meet? Well, he used to be a bouncer at the hotel, you know. Back when I was just a kid, I was working a show at the Neptune here, and I asked if this was the Poseidon Grand, and he said no. Got me real turned around. Later on, I learned that trick when you ask him, what would you say if I asked you if this was the Poseidon Grand and that makes it a lot easier to talk with him and we hit it off like gangbusters, she squints. Only, I guess not like gangbusters, more like gang promoters. We got along real good is what I mean. He's a lot more interested than that other doorman who only told the truth, <laughs> of course. 
Um, hey, do you work part-time as a mermaid? I sure do. Guess you saw my act, huh? Feels good to get out of that wacky get-up for the night. And let's go get her order. Shake a leg, would you? All right. Um, so I wonder... This clearly leads to the aquarium. Um, I wonder if I can just change. Uh, remove uniform. <laughs> Remo uh, wear mermaid. You wriggle into the shiny, scale-covered trousers. Boy, these are tight. No wonder they tell you not to overfeed fish if they're expected to get in these pants. The seashell brassiere isn't the easiest to get on either. Eventually you're in, though, and you make a pretty darn swell mermaid if you do say so yourself. Well, now that we're dressed for a dip, let's go. You sit down and slide into the water. Uh, I wonder what happens if I come in with a dog. Inside the tank. You're floating inside the huge lobby fish tank. The hotel looks weird and distorted through the glass. The hidden exit hatch is in the ceiling above you, and the tank's pebbly floor lies far below. Uh, let's look at the floor. Ah, tank bottom. You're floating just above the layer of pebbles at the bottom of the tank. Patches of seaweed sway in the gentle currents. Outside, you can see the hotel lobby. Let's get that oyster. Uh, up and up. Uh, so let's look at the oyster. This thing is huge. It's got to be at least 30 pounds if it's an ounce, and it's a lot more than an ounce. Uh, I just kind of tucked that under my arm, real casual-like. Um, remove mermaid. Where? You peel off the mermaid get-up and neatly fold it into a scandalously small package. All right. And I'm back in the uniform. So, push button. Uh, I need the dog. So, that's on the second floor. Let's get the dog. Uh, the other thing I can do now is see if I can help here. So, uh, oh, I didn't go far enough. Here we go. Uh, show fruit to Crispin. Put fruit in bowl. Uh, so, uh, maybe, oh, put fruit on table. Put apple in bowl. Oh, okay. I was saying fruit, and it didn't know that I meant both of them. Put orange in bowl. Talk to Crispin. Something with a bowlish, vacious, dishish quality. Maybe in blue, maybe white, and it's large or small. Um, oh, good luck. So that isn't working. Get apple and orange. I also have the banana, right? I do. Put orange, apple, just to see. Uh, nothing new there. Okay. Ah. So I can, I got the bowl. Um. Can I sit on the table? Ha! Let's see if I can encourage him to paint me. You plop your posterior on the small table. Crispin sighs, a real sire, this one. If only I could paint you, he said, but the rules are clear. It's a container of fruit or nothing. <laughs> okay. Uh, eat apple. Crunch. So long, apple. Eat banana. You swallow banana in a few bites. Yum. Eat orange. You peel and eat the orange. It's round, sweet, and a little tart, which are fine things for an orange, or anyone, to be. Yum. So what happens now? Now that I contain the fruit. Ha. Huh. It's a container of fruit or nothing. So who's not a container of fruit? I've eaten a banana, an orange, and an apple. I'm a regular fruit salad. You mean you really, Crispin brightens. Then I can paint you. I can paint you. Oh, this is wonderful. Hold this. I have to capture you now. As Crispin picks up his paintbrush, the ghostly presence erupts from his body. Now's your chance to get rid of up, up, up. Let's keep that pose. Two hours later, Crispin finishes the painting and leaves, a tune on his lips. Uh, a bored-looking ghost. I bet he's a bored-looking ghost. Let's drink. Uh, you can see a portrait of a stunningly beautiful girl here. We'll look at that in a second. Let's look. Let's drink the ghost. You know, these things could really use a little garnish. An olive or something. But there's nothing for it now, so you deploy your drinker, and soon the ghost is nothing more than a hiccup and a grin. Uh, the portrait. It's a picture of a beautiful bellhop eagerly clutching a suitcase. Excellent. All right, so we've taken care of both of those ghosts. Um, we have taken care of the ghost at the seance. Let's go take care of the vault. 
First floor, please. The vault is south and east. Put dog in slot. Barnaby just fits through the slot and wriggles out of your arms with a determined bark. Can Barnaby Mooch, the magnificent pooch, escape from the vault of doom? Will he do it, folks? A minute passes. Two minutes. When the tension is almost more than you can bear, there's a kerchunk, and the vault door swings open. There, amid a fair fanfare of trumpets, stands Barnaby. He takes a bow, trots forward, and thoughtfully kicks the door shut behind him, but not before the vault's ghost has slithered out as well. I appreciate that design touch so that we can't go... You don't have to implement the vault that way, since it's not important. A giggling ghost. Well, let's drink that giggling ghost. Slurp! Now you've got an even half dozen of these little things gurgling around down there. You're starting to feel like a slightly plastered egg carton. Okay, uh, let's go cook the oysters. Um, that was west, north. Um, we got to go to the lounge and then to the kitchen. Um, cook oyster. Um, What if I... So, there's nothing to cook them in. Huh. Oh, by the way, I never looked at that textbook. A thick textbook with a painting of a bowl of fruit on the cover. The title, emblazoned in heavy gilt le stamped lettering, is How to Be a Real Artist, the One and Only Path to Artistic Accomplishment by Dr. Winston Clive of the Puget Sound College of Agriculture. Nice. Uh, so I need some, uh, oven? Nope. So, no oven. So, how am I going to boil an oyster? Oh, just with salt. Okay, I think that is a hint, which means I need to go back to the natatorium salt water pool it's a bubbling pool of hot salt water excellent put oh, i never looked at that beach scene the painting glows with life bright sands blue skies warm sun bathers frolicking in the surf in the foreground is lush beach grass and off to one side a whitewashed changing shed the door of the shed looks so real you just have to run your fingers over it and you feel rough wood it is real Looks like there's a way east from here, cleverly concealed as part of the painting. The boiler room. Okay. You pull open the cleverly concealed whitewashed door. Beyond is a dark, cramped boiler room. About 90% of the space inside is taken up by an immense medieval-looking boiler, and about half of what's left is full of awkwardly placed pipes and a large rusty valve wheel. That leaves a whopping 5% of the room available for you to occupy, which isn't ideal for a girl with a 6% sized figure. You suck in your extra percentage point and just manage to scoot past the pipes. It's repulsively hot and cramped in here, and the sound of rushing water is deafening. The only way out is back west to the natatorium. Uh, so I'm going to put the oyster in the pool. I'm guessing it won't be warm enough. So we need to turn valve. The wheel squeaks as you turn it. The rush, wash, rush of water lessens. Uh... The boiler. It's about the size of a luxury car and probably weighs twice as much. It looks like it probably started life boiling witches to death in the 13th century. Every so often it clunks and shudders ominously. It's connected to a mess of pipes. Uh, the pipes go in all directions. The largest leads west. Probably those are the pipes that supply the natatorium pools with water. The thickest of pipes is equipped with a rusty valve wheel. Turn wheel. It's getting harder to turn. The water sounds like a trickle now. Oh, um, which means it's probably heating out here. Oh, ice cold. Nope. So, open valve. Turn valve. With a grunt, you turn the wheel as tight as it can go, shutting off the hot water entirely. The only way to turn it now is back in the other direction. Uh, let's see what happens then if I wait a minute. Uh, all right, turn valve. Maybe it's going to let the water get hot enough and because I shut it off for a minute. You've barely touched the wheel when it begins spinning on its own as the pent-up pressure from the boiler forces the valve fully open and water rushes loudly through the pipe. It's a boiling, bubbling cauldron of hot, salty water. And the saltwater pool is an oyster's amour. We have boiled them. Excellent. All right. So I'm not going to reach into the boiling water. Uh, let's... Uh, pool. 
oysters amour. You fish it out of the water. Of course I do. Um, all right, so we need to go back up to the third floor and give oysters to Gams. Uh, let's talk to the Gams then. One extra large order of oysters and more boiled to perfection. You brought it, Gam squealed, leaping to her feet. Oh, thank you, thank you. This will reignite the passion. I just know it. She shoulders the oversized oyster and, staggering under the weight, hauls it into the main suite. Cookie, Vincent, it's feeding time for Mommy's little treasure. You hear a splash as she drops the oyster into the aquarium. Gams reappears in the doorway, her eyes bright. It's working. They're eating. And once they're done, they're going to be frisky as fry. My poor lonely goldfish will be in love again, just like they used to be. That's an excellent misdirect. She gives you a peck on the cheek, followed by a wink. Now, let's get out of here. My little babies are going to be needing their privacy. Throwing on a bathrobe, she dances happily out of the suite, leaving the ghost that was haunting her behind. Back in the bedroom. Oh, there's the giggling ghost. Drink, ghost. Usurped down the fermented fiend with the skill of an expert and the coordination of a gal with six drinks in her already. But never mind that. You catch it eventually. Something tells you, as the ghost giggles its way down your gullet, that you've just polish off the penultimate poltergeist. Now, half ghost-faced and armed with your wily wits and a stomach sloshing with snag spirits, it's time to return to the gents' locker room and finish off the last and worst of the bunch. So let's head out. I appreciate also uh, telling me what I need to be, where I need to be going for this. Open locker. The locker pulses under your hands and you feel the seal cracking. You're confident, secure, and half in the bag. You've cleared the hotel of the other ghosts. All that's left to do is polish off this last one. I am done with this place. Let's guzzle us a ghost. You throw open the locker and... Nothing. Just an empty locker. What a royal platter of the phonus balonus. Until you realize that the musty room is somehow brand new. The tiles less cracked. The locker's gleaming. It's like you've stepped back into the past, like in that Christmas book, except instead of watching some crusty old blue nose waste his childhood working, you're seeing what happened here in this very room some eight years ago. Donnie Cantaloupe swaggers in, dressed in a bathing suit, a towel around his neck. He's still huge, but in a different order, with more of his bulk filed under M for muscles, or maybe for M for Mamma Mia, what a dish. It's enough to make you want to run right out of here, find your younger self, and tell her to ditch the hopscotch a couple of years early. Uh, let's try to, uh, yeah, let's try to attract. You wave at Donnie, but he doesn't seem to see you. You whistle. You stand behind him and tap him on the shoulders. Your finger goes straight through, but he turns around anyway and looks right at you, which pretty much makes you jump out of your skin. He's not looking at you, though, but at the woman entering the room. Who's the dame? She bears more than a passing resemblance to Agent Bird, a tall, severe-looking brunette in business-like tweed. This woman is older, though, with a sharp chin and a streak of gray in her hair. She storms up to Donnie, waving a finger in his face. Don't think you can run away from me, Mr. Cantaloupes. Didn't I tell you to back off, you dizzy harpy? Donnie roars back. One of your goons did mention it. Yes, the woman says. I believe his exact words were, One of these days they'll find you floating face down in the sound. I told him that was an ugly threat, and he said, and I quote, It could be uglier. They could find you fo floating face up. Donnie chuckles. Chuckles. I fail to see what's so funny, Mr. Cantaloupes. What would you, your friends at City Hall say if they knew you consorted with such ruffians? Donnie crosses his arms. And what would your fancy schmancy temperance lady say if they knew Mildred Waverly hung around in men's changing rooms? Waverly grins. I made very sure that nobody saw me come in here, Mr. Cantaloupes. You can't hide behind your goons anymore. It's just you and me. Just you and me, huh? Donnie says, casually approaching. She looks so much smaller than he does, and yet she stands straight and proud. No witnesses, and that's when he lunges for her. It's nearly a minute before Waverly finally breaks the kiss, again, great misdirect, to shoot a nervous look around the room. You're quite sure we're really alone? It's a little late to be worried about that. Isn't it a little late to be worried about that? Besides, didn't I tell you I gave them the night off? Donnie says, stroking her hair. I thought you meant you didn't. Oh, I... I'm sorry, it's just impossible, the way you talk. Poor Rosie used to have the same problem, but we fixed it years ago, thank goodness. Didn't I explain I can get around it by putting everything in the form of a question? Like a stutterer learning to sing his words instead of saying them. Yes, I understand, it's 
just confusing, that's all. She gives him a teasing grin. Sometimes I think things would have been easier if I'd fallen for the other doorman, the one who always tells the truth. And what fun would that be? Not much, Waverly admits, and we wouldn't have Rosie. How is Rosie anyway, Donnie says. Got to be getting pretty big now, by now, isn't she? Nearly 15, and no, thank goodness, given that Walter is five foot two and weighs less than I do, we're lucky she didn't end up with your body structure. Any girl would be lucky not to end up with my body structure, don't you think? Now, that's not what I meant. You're very handsome for a mountain. She puts her head on his shoulders. Oh, Donnie, I wish you could see her. I wish we didn't have to play around like this. Don't you think I wish that too? I know you do. You're a good man, Donnie, but you've made a choice to do evil things. She sighs. Those I, though I suppose I'm hardly one to talk about that, am I? Nevertheless, as long as you continue to sell this poison, what if I stop? What? Just like that? What do I need more money for? Wouldn't it be nice if we could all be a family? He reaches into the locker and pulls out a bottle of champagne. What would you say if I told you I picked this up today and it'll be the last bottle of booze I ever buy? Now, how about a toast? You know I never touch. It's okay just this once, isn't it? You don't think I'll tell any of your hoity-toity friends, do you? I suppose not, Mildred says, blushing. She allows Donnie to pour her a glass and clinks it against his. Very well, just one. To us. She gulps it down and makes a face. Honestly, Donnie, I don't know where you get this cheap... And then her hand flies to her throat, and she collapses to the tile, her face ashen. Poisoned. How? Not by Donnie. Any thought of that leaves your head when you see the look on his face as she falls, and the way he holds her as she dies. He's still holding her when one of his weasley-looking henchmen saunter in. The goon's eyes widen as he takes in the scene. Holy smokes, boss! You actually cacked the broad! Donnie turns to look at him. Silently, he nods. Suddenly, you smell strong spirits. You turn and you're face to face with the ghost of Mildred Waverly. Her ectoplasmic body ripples and shimmers in the light. She's holy like a hunk of Swiss cheese, the liquid weeping from the spots where the missing chunks of her body should be. She raises one hand and crooks her fingers towards you. Your belly gurgles. The spirits in the hotel, you realize, weren't really ghosts at all, but fragments of Mildred she left behind. And she's calling them back. A dizzying wave of sobriety crashes over you as the liquid leeches from your body and returns to hers. When your vision clears, she stands in front of you, whole. She looks down into her hands, turning them over and over, observing their translucency. I was so confused, she said, but now I remember now. I thought the alcohol killed me, but, but it was denatured alcohol. Poison. We knew it was out there, and we didn't do anything to take it out of the supply. We decided, she smiles sadly, we decided that anyone who drank it deserved what they got. She pulls a body from somewhere and pours a glass of something sparkling. Seems so silly now. Here, drink this. I'll explain in a moment. So we drink. You drain the glass. It's pure and refreshing with a surprising kick. There you go, Hazel. You know, you really ought to cut back a bit. You're a smart girl, but you'd be smarter if you weren't plastered on cheap hooch all the time. The light suddenly brightens. It's coming from a direction you can't quite make out, except that it's not a cardinal direction, or up, or down, or even in or out. Mildred turns to look in that same impossible direction and smiles. But I suppose that's up to you now. It's time for me to go. No more meddling in the world of the living for me. She steps not north or south or up or down, and she's gone, leaving you alone in the locker room. The very warm locker room. The very warm and wobbly locker room with the moving floor. Mildred pops back in from wherever she went. Oh, I did say I would explain, didn't I? This is going to sound awfully hypocritical, but I had to return what I took, and I needed a vessel through which to symbolically return it, so that drink I just poured you was, in a spiritual sense anyway, several thousand drinks, and I'm afraid you're going to be rather seriously inebriated in a moment, so she's already fading out again, or maybe your vision is blurring. Say goodbye to Rosie for me, and that's about where you pass out. Or maybe you're actually passing back in, because all of a sudden you've got the cold locker room floor pressed up against your back and Agent Bird slapping you in the face. Wake up, she says, before turning to someone you can't see because you can't move your head without everything smearing like a Picasso. I like the tie back. It's no use. She's too drunk. Get me a bucket of cold water. I'm not drunk, you try to protest, but it comes out more like, I'm not drunk, because right, you are, in fact, ossified right out of your little blonde skull, the same skull which Agent Bird proceeds to lubricate with a gallon of ice water. You're lucky to be alive, she says, helping you up. The explosion shook the hotel. The whole hotel. Donnie Cantaloupes rushes into the room, shoving onlookers out of the way. 
What's going on in here? He bellows. Don't you know this is the gentleman's changing area? I'm ready for this reveal. It's going to be great. Agent Bird stands up triumphant. It's clear to me exactly what's happened, she says. You were hiding a cache of highly flammable contraband in this locker room, trusting it's the one place I'd never dare check. This unfortunate girl snuck in to sample the merchandise, overindulged, lost her head enough to light up a quick jazz cigarette, and boom. That's exactly what happened, Donnie says. Aha! Yeah, you're taking the boss out of context, says Donnie's right-hand man, weaseling up. You gotta remember his speech impediment. And say, boss, I gotta tell you, I was checking the mineral water, and it's back to being mineral water, not, uh, mineral water, if you get me, see? Aha again, Agent Bird says. Don't think I don't know what you're talking about. Men, search the place. We've got you this time, cataloops. And when I bust this place up from stem to stern, not only will we uncover your operation, we'll find evidence for the rest of it, too. You'll finally face justice for the murder of Mildred Waverly. She leans forward, getting right in the big man's face. You killed my mother, she hisses, and pretty soon I'll be able to prove it. Suddenly all business again. She backs off and kneels to face you. Miss, we're going to need a statement. You don't want to give a statement. In fact, you don't really feel like moving. You feel peaceful. Mildred Waverly is in a better place. The hotel has been reboozed. Excuse me. <clears throat> and even if the bar's closed, you're already nicely sloshed. You just want to put your head back on the floor and go to sleep. But Agent Bird is waiting. You're going to have to tell her something. It's about your mother. Your mother did this, you say. Or her ghost did. She was angry with the hotel, and I don't blame her, because the way she died would have steamed anyone's celery. But it wasn't Donnie Cantaloupe's who killed her. No, it wasn't, Donnie Cantaloupe says suddenly. I didn't kill her. Gas spring out from the crowd as people work out what he just said. Uh, boss, said Weasley, let's not say anything we shouldn't ought to say in front of Janie Law here. I didn't kill her, Cantaloupe says again. I've been I haven't been carrying this secret around for eight long years. I'm not tired of it. No, I didn't kill her. It wasn't an accident, but that means I'm not responsible. It's not time for me to take responsibility for that. I don't deserve to go to jail. Nah, she wouldn't want that, you say. The ghost showed me how she died, see? And the ghost, Agent Bird explains explodes the ghost this is a serious investigation not a showcase for your dts no really there was a ghost lots of ghosts i've got these pair of cheaters see and you put your hand to your face where are your special glasses they're gone and just where is this exactly is this ghost now um i'm not sure heaven i think that's what I thought. And why, pray tell, do you think my mother would want me to show any regard to the criminal who killed her, even accidentally? It's like this. Well, what the heck. It's not over until the slightly curvier-than-average lady sings, so you might as well get singing. Because I'm pretty sure this criminal is your father. What? Agent Bird says. See, she and Cantaloupes were passionately in love. They were talking about you in the vision just before she died, which incidentally happened because she drank from a bottle of denatured alcohol by accident. He's your father, all right. Look, I've got parental issues, too. Although at least my parents are married, and who boy, maybe I shouldn't have spilled this in front of all your co-workers, but oh well, there it is. Cantaloupes is your dad. Well, if the girl I found lying drunk in the men's changing room babbling about ghosts says it is, I suppose it must be true. Tell me, do you have even one single solitary shred of proof? Uh, I didn't think of that. I don't suppose you've both got web toes or a funny birthmark on the moneymaker or anything like that? That's what I thought. Wait, I just remembered something. Mildred said, well, when you were young, you had the same speech impediment cantaloupes does. You always said the reverse of what you meant. That's ridiculous. I never did that. You must have been really young. You might not remember, but maybe if you talked to someone who knew you back then. I said I never did that, Agent Bird says, her face turning purple. Donnie cantaloupes can, can be my father. It's possible. She claps a hand over her mouth. That's... What I meant to say, I don't mean I, she swallows. It never happens when I'm, that is to say, it only happens when I'm upset, and it doesn't prove anything. She looks at Donnie, her face a mix of curiosity and fear. But, but I suppose you're not the only one who's made an accusation they can't prove tonight. Perhaps I was too hasty, Mr. Cantaloupes. Perhaps there was more to my mother's disappearance than I knew. The booze, however, that I'm shutting you down for. It wasn't exactly the tearful reunion you might have hoped for, but it'll have to do. And so you find yourself staggering home at 6.30 in the morning, exhausted, reeking of liquor, and with instructions to talk to the police later. The old lady's going to have your hide. 
And you've already tossed your guts out onto two different lawns and one very surprised gardener who got in the way of the third lawn at the last second. It's just about your usual morning, in other words. But you know what, kid? Last night, you unhaunted a hotel with nothing more than pluck, moxie, and your own talented kisser. Now, last night, you got past every problem the Poseidon Grand could throw at you. Roof, roof! Barnaby barks happily at your feet. Oh yeah, there's that too. You got yourself a dog. All in all, not a bad night. Not a bad night at all. All right, everyone. Thanks for joining me. Uh, I hope you enjoyed watching me flail around and eventually manage to solve Zazuld. See you next week.